Welcome everyone to uh, another Crisis Conversation live from the Better Life Lab. I'm Bridget Schulte, Director of the Better Life Lab and full disclosure, this is my first day out of quarantine. I have had COVID and uh, I am delighted to be on the other side of it. If anyone thinks it's a hoax, talk to me, it's not. So today I'm really delighted to, be, uh, have, to have this panel discussion on really exploring the issues of care and how that's playing out in the 2020 election. You know, as I've covered political campaigns over the years as a reporter, one of the things that pundits would always say is that, well, care issues, they don't really move voters. Voters care about the economy or they care about jobs or they care about law and order. And so care issues haven't really had a whole lot of airtime, if you will. Um, we'll be talking later today about in um, the earlier Democratic uh, presidential debates, uh, Jedziah St. Julian, our uh, research associate, uh, analyzed how often care came up and how it mattered who stood on stage. And you had Elizabeth Warren talking about Aunt B and how critical that was for her to be able to continue to work and to, to uh, cover her care responsibilities. Well, this time, now you've still, you know, months after COVID has hit, you've got so many families who uh, are struggling. Their kids either don't have uh, childcare, the, those care options are closed down, or they've uh, been shut off. You've got schools, some are open, some are closed, some are hybrid. Parents are still struggling with remote learning. So this is what we're gonna be exploring today is the experience that people, uh, that care is really front and center in so many people's lives how is that playing out in the election today? So let me introduce our guests and we're gonna dive right in. And as always in our conversations, we welcome uh, the participation of people who are uh, listening in today. So please uh, use the chat function, share a, a story, share a, your perspective, ask a question. We'll be getting to that after we have a conversation with the panelists. So joining me today uh, is our own Rosalind Miller. She's our, um, the policy analyst of the Better Life Lab, and she's the author of a, of a report recently uh, analyzing some nationally representative survey data uh, where she found the bipartisan case for caregiving. We also have Amanda Brown Learman. She's the managing director of the Supermajority, a progressive membership-based organization that trains women to become effective advocates to build an equitable future for all women. And she's also a former political and organizing director for the Democratic National Committee. And we also have Abby McCloskey. She's an economist and founder of, the, of McCloskey Policy LLC, who has advised multiple presidential campaigns, including Howard Schultz, Jeb Bush, and Rick Perry. She is also a member of the AEI Brookings Bipartisan Working Group on Paid Leave, who's written quite a bit recently on paid leave and childcare. So Rosalind, let's start with you. Um, you, you know, the, the issue of care, uh, you know, at the Better Life Lab, our view is family and care uh, are really not partisan issues. What did you find when you were, what are some of the high points when you were re reviewing this uh, nationally representative survey data? Thanks. Um, thanks, Bridget. Yeah, that's exactly it. Care is not a partisan issue. Um, so hi, I'm Rosalind Miller. I'm a policy analyst at New America's Better Life Lab, and I'm happy to be here to share a bit about a report we published um, called The Bipartisan Case for Caregiving. To cut straight to the point, um, like we saw in the first presidential debate, we've got some very intense divides between political parties, and it only seems to get worse every day. Uh, these partisan divides run so deep that it sometimes seems nearly impossible to have honest policy conversations and use them to center and address critical issues like caregiving, which affects everybody. Um, our survey actually found a lot of people, uh, Democrats and Republicans, regardless of their party identification, overwhelmingly agree in that they value caregiving, they struggle with work-life balance, and they need better financial supports to um, balance their work and their family lives. Uh, while historically major pushes for better family supportive care policies have come from the left, more recently, especially as COVID has really worsened these issues and made care much more visible, um, more conservative politicians have been discussing the value of care as a cornerstone of the economy and proposing, proposing more ideas. However, policymakers have stalled in working across the aisle to deliver long-term and meaningful change uh, to care systems in the United States. Although care could be the issue that actually draws massive support from across the political spectrum. 
our nationally representative survey uh, that we did in partnership with NORC at the University of Chicago, uh, which was collected last year pre-COVID, shows that even before the pandemic uh, upended people's lives, um, working families, people, needed and wanted support with caregiving and paid family and medical leave in particular. Uh, we know this because of two major trends in our findings that I'll briefly cover and then we can get into the discussion. Um, one is everyone experienced work care conflict and the other is that there's this universal value for care providers, um, but there's also shared barriers to providing that care. So to go into some data on the work care conflict, um, the work care conflict trend points to the issue that we need better po care policies for people to balance work and care. Democrats and Republicans experience work care conflict equally in our survey. Regardless of gender and party, more than two thirds of caregivers among our respondents said they were employed at the same time as providing care. And of those working caregivers, two thirds had missed work to provide care. Wow. Uh, in particular, yeah, that's really, that's really something, you know, and that's really interesting that you found that, you know, that the data showed that there was this kind of equal, um, you know, equal pain, if you will, of trying to combine work and care. You know, let me let's put a pin in that for a minute, Rosalind, we'll come back to you in a minute. But Abby and Amanda, let's let's turn to you. Um, you know, uh, it's it's interesting. So w w this report and Rosalind saying is there's potentially you know, this is, a, this is potentially a great bipartisan issue, you know, and yet when you, you know, when you look at sort of what are the issues that move voters, um, you know, say in recent polls, like by Pew <laughs> Research Center, it's, it's almost as if there's two different elections in terms of what people are, are saying, it, it, you know, motivates them most, you know, on the, on the right, it tends to be the economy, you know, and on the left, it's much more about, um, you know, racial justice and climate change, um, so Abby and Amanda uh, would love to turn with, to you at this point and, and get your view. Um, Amanda, should we start with you? Sure. Um, I'm fascinated also, Rosalind, because I think uh, it you, you, we feel it all the time just in terms of care not being a partisan issue. And we um, do a lot of work having talked to women across the country about the experiences that they have that also unite us in a shared set of values, one of which is just the truth about what being a woman, what in many cases being a mom um, uh, feels like in this country. And there's so many different um, unifying experiences in that, if you will, that I think ground women in a shared set of values about what that um, what those experiences are, but also then how we think our government should represent us and how leaders should also respond um, and support the needs of women. Um, Supermajority actually got its start just because um, at the end of the day, the numbers bear out the fact that women are the majority of voters. Um, we are the supermajority. And when we elect leaders, when we put people into office, um, and we're reminded by even the presidential debate, it's like, why are there three white men on the screen right now? Um, but um, we should be able to expect so much more of our leaders and representing us and actually putting the lives and experiences of women, particularly women of color who are so deeply affected um, right now, front and center when they're thinking about how to solve the country's greatest problems. And the care crisis, the care economy, even if you will, um, speaks to how women are thinking about taking care of their children, how they're thinking about taking care of the elderly people in their communities, um, how they are thinking uh, just so many of us are also in the care industry as teachers, as domestic workers. Um, and again, a lot of that work falls onto women of color across the country who have not been paid for that work in the way that they should even before COVID. Um, and I think you know, what we've seen just through COVID is that COVID has just exacerbated, if you will, a problem that already was there, um, experiences that already were real life struggles for survival for so many women and their families across the country. Um, and COVID is just illuminating that in a different way. And I hope if there's sort of one thing good that comes from that, it is the fact that women um, see each other's 
pain in this and are able to unite in this and organize around that um, so that we do not find ourselves in this position in the future. And with the election that we have um, in just 32 days even, I hope that we can channel that when we go to the polls and just make sure that we are demanding so much more um, of our leaders, of uh, how the government needs to support women in this moment. And just thinking personally, I was, you know, saw this number even this morning, and I'm sure Rosalind and Abby, I'm sure you have like all of the numbers here, um, having, you know, researched this so deeply, but um, I saw this report that was just, um, 865,000 women have dropped out of the labor force this month, what compared to 216,000 men that did. And I think it's really important to think about the work that sort of, um, uh, Un, uh, I, yeah, I'm like rem trying to remember what exactly to call it, but just the um, the work and burden, um, if you will, that women feel um, and are oftentimes a dispute in any relationship that you're in about what women are carrying um, and facing as they're thinking about the care responsibilities that they have in their own lives and what that means for us in this moment, just thinking about the economic recession we're in and what that will do for women for not just you know, us right now in this moment, but for generations to and come. So for generations, right. Well, uh, uh, Amanda, we'll come back to you to talk more about sort of how this is translating. You know, I, I hear what you're talking about in terms of uh, trying to energize voters, but sort of uh, kind of how that's playing out uh, in terms of moving uh, issues in voters. But Abby, let's turn to you at this point. Um, you know, what is it that you're seeing? Uh, what do you see that's different this election uh, when it comes to care in, in terms of, um, you know, what you've seen in previous elections. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for hosting all this. Bridget, it's good to be with you guys. Um, you know, I think given the nature of the crisis that we're in, it's often been said that elections aren't won or lost based on policy alone or even based on the economy. But given the devastation to our economy from COVID, it's actually become an outsized issue across party lines, not surprisingly. Um, there was a recent Axios poll in Ohio, a swing state, that showed concerns about jobs and the economy are the number one concern of voters there, over and above healthcare and education and COVID and the other top tier issues we tend to think about. And I think what's especially interesting in this election is that you can't talk about, to Amanda's point, you can't really talk about the economic recovery and jobs without talking about caregiving. You just can't slide it into that tertiary slot like you were talking about bridges, a tag on issue, when mm -hmm. it's so core to the unemployment crisis um, and labor market crisis that we're seeing. So I recently worked on a poll with Bipartisan Policy Center looking at the unemployed persons in our economy. We have 13 million still, even though that number has gone down, it's a huge, a huge number of people. And the number one reason why parents who are unemployed are not looking to go back to work is because of caregiving. It's mm -hmm. because of school closures, because right. of childcare closures. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a significant issue in this election in particular. And, and as such, you know, you've seen Vice President Biden put forward quite, you know, historic $775 billion caregiving package. And while President Trump has not released many plans on any issue about what he would do for reelection, he is running on his accomplishments for working families, running in part on his accomplishments for working families in his first term, mm -hmm. which uh, for a Republican president are somewhat you know, and in a good way, out of step with his predecessors in terms of um, advocating for paid leave and child care. So you're seeing kind of this, to Rosalind's point and the data showing bipartisan issue, interest in the issue, I do think you're seeing that play out in, in politics as well and in this election. You know, to stick with you, Abby and Amanda, you know, is it finally sort of the, the people are beginning to see at, to your point, that you really can't have uh, an economic recovery without having childcare. And that this, you know, rather than being seen as a side issue or a women's issue or a nice to have kind of issue that it's really central when you're talking about jobs in the economy. I mean, do you, uh, you know, um, Abby, let's start with you. Are you seeing that in terms of how candidates are even talking or addressing issues? Yeah, you know, I think a, a bit of the nuance of it in um, what you certainly see play out politically is the environment we're in because of COVID and school closures and, mm -hmm. you know, two out of five children who were in childcare prior to the pandemic are no longer in those arrangements. That there's a very acute crisis. And I think that 
policy members of, you know, of both parties are interested in solving that acute crisis. Joni Ernst has put forward child care plans, um, the Senate Republicans, the House Democrats, the new House Democrat bill all have included relatively similar amounts, if not even slightly more on the Republican side for helping shore up child care facilities. I think to your point, Bridget, it is, is, it, it is it is true that the current moment we're in is very different and unique. We're not normally dealing with these type of school closures and child care closures, which calls for like a unique set of solutions. And I think there's there's agreement that we must like we must make the system stronger. How that translates into longer term reform, I think, is is a bit less clear. And I think the set of issues, you know, to Amanda's point, that have always been there and have just been exacerbated in the current crisis are still somewhat different when you're looking at a permanent policy. And mm -hmm. so what I'm, I'm interested to see is how does this translate, you know, kind of beyond the crisis we're in to two or two to four years from now. Right. You know, so Amanda, to, you know, to that same point, um, you know, are we getting more unity, like you're saying, that sort of the sense of shared narrative, shared story, shared pain, and yet, when it comes to how we solve it and, you know, kind of what a public role is in terms of public policy, is that where there is still a lot of uh, difference? Or, or what are you hearing in terms of how that's shaping uh, voters' expectations as well as uh, campaign uh, issues and priorities and, and candidate discussion? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think the, um, the solutions, if you will, definitely are... Um, different on either side of the aisle how um, and I, I think one thing that really resonates with me personally is the the issue of care has always been sort of relegated as this like women's issue um, and one thing that you're seeing also happen um, in this pandemic this moment of I mean just great economic like injustice and all, all of the injustice that's sort of um, bubbling, if you will, right now in our country um, is that it's becoming more than just a women's issue. It's becoming also more than just about child care, which mm -hmm. to be honest, I mean, no, neither party has been able to advance that. And I, I mean, I would be, I would dare say that that's also because we do not have a representative government that is thinking about how to respond to um, child care and paid leave and that whole conversation, which is off, again, a women's issue to so many, um, but it's about how do we take care of our parents in this moment mm -hmm. who we have to pull out of nursing homes? How do... Uh, the teachers, um, my little sister is even a teacher and she works at a charter school in DC and she's 20, 27 years old and she had to fill out a will to go back to school because oh, wow. um, it's, I mean, it's just crazy what the sort of expectation is, but those are essential workers and they are disproportionately women, they're disproportionately women of color. Um, I think it's also expanding the conversation around care in terms of the support that we provide to domestic workers who all of us are dependent upon. Um, again, I think about, can reflect on my own experience um, and recognize all of the privilege and sort of luxury I have in this to have, uh, to be able to send my daughter to, and my three-year-old to a program um, outside of the home still every day. And every day I'm like, please don't close today. Um, and my, I have a one-year-old um, and we have a nanny, but, you know, thinking about the risk that like I, I felt personally a deep sort of um, had a lot of anxiety about asking her to come back, but mm -hmm. like I also have to work and you need a job as well. And so just the um, just the responsibilities I think that we have to respond to the again the domestic care working community that are millions of jobs in this country that have been in many ways devastated this mm -hmm. year. Um, and I think that I'm, I think that again, if there's um, something to be said for what this moment can do is really change the conversation and broaden it beyond just that of childcare, because mm -hmm. it and beyond just that of people, again, being able to cast it aside as a women's issue, and it is affecting 
every parent in a way, um, every uh, every family in a in a deeper way than I think um, that I think allows for a conversation, if you will, and hopefully will allow for some bipartisan solutions to that, and at least call on every leader up and down the ballot to try to address this. Um, the one other thing I would say is that it's not. Oh, and one thing that I even learned in the 2018 cycle is it's not just about what our president says or what or even at the presidential level that so many of the um, rules and laws and policies that govern govern our everyday lives are made at the state level or even the local level um, and the ability for us to band together, organize, and put people in those positions of leadership that also represent us. And I'm um, just thinking about the incredible wave of women who have are running on that even, um, and ran on that in 2018, are running on that in 2020 to be real leaders and real heroes and actually responsive to the needs of um, their constituencies and their, their communities right now. So I, I want to, um, Rosalind, I want to bring you in in a minute, but Abby, I, I saw that you you had something to add. And I did want to ask you, um, you know, just Amanda mentioned in 2018, there was this wave of uh, women uh, running and winning, although we're still at a fairly dismal 24% in Congress, uh, although that's that's better than it has been. But there was a loss in terms of in, in the GOP side, there are fewer women, you know, so that's a concern. Um, you know, at the same time, I guess one of the other things that I'm wondering for for so long, the national conversation has been from the right. Well, there is no government role. Family is a private responsibility. You know, don't have kids if you can't afford them. Figure it out on your own, kind of. I'm just wondering, is COVID beginning to shift that narrative on the right? You know, yeah. is there a beginning to, to, you know, is there a beginning of a conversation of like, Families really can't do it on their own. These are markets that don't really work, that we really do need some kind of public uh, involvement. I'm, I'm just really curious what's what's happening on the right. Yeah, there's really so much to say. It's hard to think of uh, where to start, but I do think, you know, when you look at the GOP the last decade, right, you think of the Tea Party and the Freedom Caucus and Grover Norquist's tax pledge. There's been a resistance, not just to caregiving programs, but to any new federal program out of the belief that the debt is already at unprecedented and continuing to grow levels. The federal right. government is, you know, maybe more the source of our problems than the solution. That said, I, I am a firm believer that that is changing specifically in the area of care. And I do want to give the Trump, you know, administration credit where credit's due in terms of helping to put forward some of these policies for the first time as a Republican um, presidential candidate and, and president. And I am seeing, I think, bipartisan movement in Congress also. And, you know, we have bipartisan proposals for paid leave. The child care proposals are actually not that far off. I think that both sides really would support some type of child care subsidy um, by income bracket to mm -hmm. help low wage families in particular be able to afford child care and specifically a child care option of their choice if that's home based care or center based care. I think I think there's more commonality there than maybe meets the eye and potential for um, more momentum than is initially obvious. And so like I take great comfort in that. And you know, I don't think you have to experience something directly to empathize with it. But that said, it is interesting to see the types of folks, even on the GO, especially on the GOP side, advocating for these types of caregiving reforms. Ivanka Trump, Senator Rubio, Senator Lee, Senator Ernst, one of the few GOP women in Congress that who has has children. Like these are people who have had personal experience and run up against the system and have seen in their own, you know, with their own two eyes that wait, this isn't work like like how it should work. It and is um, mm -hmm. if it's unfair for me, how much more unfair is it for people who have less resources um, and, and connections than I do. And so I thought it was interesting, even the last two weeks or so, Megan McCain, who's the daughter of um, Senator McCain, had a child. And one of the tweets around the birth of her child was how outrageous it is that the US doesn't have a 12 week paid uh, parental leave program and you know had never advocated it for it before. And I'm encouraged to see it. But I think as, you know, as millennial, women and men in particular begin to take on positions of political influence and have seen how this, this kind of promise we were made implicitly about have more education, have a job and have a family, like 
the system is not set up to help with that. In fact, it really hinders it in so many ways and that has to change. But I think that's creating kind of this uh, desire for change, both in kind of the grassroots side and then also among key, um, key leaders in Congress and in the White House. And so I just hope that that momentum can continue. So Rosalind. Think, um, Abby, you just made me think about from one of my previous jobs actually it was in uh, the business community and we're looking specifically at how women um, face and overcome struggles that they have in entrepreneurship. And I remember reading all these studies even about how business policies changed with so many men also at the top, sitting at the top. And um, there was one research study actually that was like, for men, um, they start to see things differently when they have daughters. And there was also something to be said that it was like, they need to have three daughters before they <laughs> will, um, affect real change. And I remember just being like, everyone needs to have three children. <laughs> you know, like, how can we make that happen um, to actually create, you know, better business policy. And it's interesting to see how I like, I hope that there's lessons to be learned from that, um, just in terms of how the government response looks like also to support women, uh, women and their families as well. Yeah, and, and there's similar studies about um, female like politicians. Right. And to Bridget's point, I think that is why it's concerning to see the drop in female representation in the GOP. Because we do know that uh, female congresswomen tend to advocate for these types of policies more. Mm -hmm. And if that becomes, you know, if the GOP becomes kind of an older white male party, um, I think the potential for the necessary bipartisan action right. becomes less. And I fear that if it becomes partisan on either side what the solution is, that it will just be, you know, enveloped into this churn we've seen now with healthcare and regulation, everything else, it just kind of changes with each administration and is not a policy that families can depend on. And goodness knows, like, families have had sifting, shifting sands underneath them now, especially with COVID and before for so long, like, there needs to be a policy that they can, can, can root into and depend on and know is there, not something that changes with the partisan winds. Yeah. So, Rosalind, let's bring you back in at this point. And um, we do have a question. Um, uh, we're coming down on time. But but Rosalind, you know, uh, some of this, this kind of grassroots momentum, you know, the survey that you were analyzing, this was even before COVID. And it certainly sounds like there, you know, I guess, what did you see in terms of that uh, potential for, for grassroots momentum, that potential for um, really support for care and care policy uh, across the political spectrum? Great. Uh, we found that um, there were similar levels of Republicans and Democrats. So Republicans at 72% and Democrats at 74% who agreed that the number one reason that men couldn't afford, uh, couldn't uh, take paid leave to care for their family members, aging sick or newborn babies um, is that they can't afford to. And so there's this very clear connection between uh, financial supports and the trade-offs that families have to make between working and taking care. Uh, of their families. And for many families, uh, care is often seen as this private issue that should be handled in private, but mm -hmm. caregiving is something that really impacts every single aspect of life from workforce participation to education to health. And it may be a private matter, but it has major public effects. Um, so care policies need to be de be designed inclusively and comprehensively for families to actually see how it affects them and how they're included in that policy, especially mm -hmm. diverse families, rural families, single parents, um, and how they can actually use that support. For example, we know that people, particularly men in the workforce, are more likely to use benefits like paid leave when the wage replacement rate is higher. Um, so that points to the financial aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. So if finances are a major reason we're not able to take leave um, to provide care, then I think that's a policy where it needs to be built very inclusively with better incentives to actually encourage people to see themselves reflected in that policy and how they can access and use it. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me uh, pose this to the panelists here. We've got a question from Elaine Meyer. She says, I'm curious what the guests think about alternate family models than the nuclear, nuclear family, like extended family living under one roof or some kind of shared care, caregiving that might be happening with the pods that have sprouted up during COVID. 
do you think policy could encourage such approaches, kind of thinking beyond the nuclear family? Um, Abby, Amanda, Rosalind, any, anyone want to jump in on that? Well, you know, I certainly think we're seeing an explosion of all sorts of different types of family arrangements, and that becomes a real consideration in childcare in particular. Um, yeah, which is why, you know, I, I really sympathize with uh, Vice President Biden's proposal for caregiving that really allows a lot of flexibility in terms of the provider of types of care. Mm -hmm. I think that choice in this type of environment is really important and um, not only for family structure, but also in the COVID environment where people aren't comfortable sending, a lot of people aren't comfortable sending their children to center-based care. And so there needs to be kind of more choice built into the types of policies we have. Um, yeah, that said, I, you know, I do obviously desperately want there to be reform, paid leave reform, childcare reform, caregiving reform. And I, you know, would caution to, instead of having kind of the all encompassing policy all at once, that there is some wisdom I, I've come to believe in an incremental approach and kind of starting with um, the relationships where we have the most data like parent to child and things like that and trying to secure that before, um, before rippling out into kind of a broader set of policies. Well, let's wrap it up with the, with that with that very thought. You know, uh, where do we go from here, and how do we get to uh, to the point where uh, there is that sort of you know uh, voter um, energy around care issues, where there is a response from politicians, uh, an understanding that actually leads to policy. Uh, Amanda, let's go to you. What, what what what's the path forward? How do we how do we get to the point where where care really is a big issue and families really get the help they need? No, definitely. And just to um, my response to Elaine's question is related to this. I think that actually speaks to what women um, and families are facing right now in terms of just how to survive every single day. Like that, um, those extended models, if you will, I think are sometimes out of desperation um, and like a, a need to just get through the next day, um, perhaps rather than being like, what is everyone's ideal situation, right? Um, and I think we do need to acknowledge that and acknowledge the choice in that. And that's one of the things that um, when I think about, you know, the, what, the work that we have to do in the 32 days ahead, when women are struggling so much every single day just to get by and this is what I hear from women um, when I talk to them they're like I can't feed my chil my children today or I had to make an impossible choice of going to work or staying at home with my sick kid or I mean they're just facing these really impossible decisions and choices right now that I'm mm -hmm. like can you please make sure to vote um, and I you know sometimes feel like I'm asking them to do something like add another thing to their plate in terms of um, making sure that they get mobilized around this because I do I worry just about the weight and the burden of everyday life of women right now that um, we have to do everything we can to organize to make sure that that shows up at the polls and that women are taking the time to vote in their best interests and vote for their families, vote for their children, vote for the future generation um, around this issue specifically, because we need leaders who are going to um, actually address the problems that we're facing every single day. And until we show that power and um, just turn the conversation into political power, if you will. Um, I I think that that's, that's the need in this moment. That's the urgency in this moment. Um, and I think having, making sure that women have that, know that that's a priority and see that as the opportunity of what needs to happen on election day um, and to change the conversation. Like that's where we are. That's the number one, you know, that's the number one goal of supermajority right now is to make sure that we can turn that sort of despair um, into power. Hour. All right. Uh, I, I hate to do this because I feel like we could go on forever. Abby, did you have a, a quick final closing thought to start turning despair into action? Well, I mean, I think the biggest immediate thing that needs to happen is there needs to be a COVID relief package for the child care centers at risk of closing for the children home from school, for the working parents. If there's bipartisan momentum to do it. It just actually needs to get done and shouldn't be punted until after the election. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I wanna to thank uh, our panelists. I'd love to thank the participants. 
the New America events team, our fantastic Better Life Lab team, uh, our producer, David Schulman. Um, please come back. We'll be, we'll, uh, in a, the, later this month, we'll be having a, another, another conversation of setting the agenda for what have we learned through COVID to set a really bold agenda for a future of work family justice where care is really elevated and valued. So we'll be having that on October 23rd. We hope that you'll come back for that. In the meantime, <laughs> wash your hands, wear a mask, stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you in a few weeks.